Taylor Walker from the Adelaide Crows, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Shannon Hearn from the West Coast Eagles. This is Nathan Jones from the Melbourne Football Club. Phil Davis from the GOS Giants. It's Brad Ebert from Port Adelaide Football Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hello, you are with MJ, and welcome to a special edition of the Coaches Panel podcast. Joining me on, on this very special podcast, I, I got Jimmy. Hello, mate. How are you? Hello, MJ. Hello, listeners. The reason we've jumped into the studio super quick is uh, now just a mere hours ago. Uh, some horrible news uh, for Tom Mitchell, both him personally for the football club and their supporters, and yeah, to a lesser extent, even though that's what we're about, the fantasy footy community. Some pretty terrible news. Uh, this morning, uh, Friday morning, a uh, confirmed injury during a training uh, kind of drill. Uh, where he is now going to require surgery on his leg. And uh, he has been all but ruled out for the majority of the 2019 season. So, um, you know, gosh, it, it's been a couple of hours ago. So it's not as if, you know, they're going to be like, nah, he's definitely coming back this year. Um, some horrible news for, obviously, Tom personally. You know, Brownlow medalist last year. Certainly a fantasy beast and, and one of the most important AFL players um, you know, in the competition for their side, and certainly for AFL fantasy coaches, super coaches, and dream teamers, it's a big change for us. Because Jimmy, let's talk about. We are going to talk through drafts, keeper leagues, probably more than than draft leagues. Um, you know, replacements. Uh, I think it's just a huge um, bit of bad luck, ultimately, isn't it? Yeah. Look, I think um, you know we we declare today a national day of mourning. Take the rest oh. of the afternoon off, and. Um... Yeah, have a look at, at what we're just going to do now in terms of, um, yeah, uh, the various format of, of fantasy. It's, um, yeah, it's as much as a, a bit of bad luck, it's um, now I think, yeah, that's done. It is what it is. And, and mm. yeah, terrible news for, for him and those around him and, um, and and for the football world in general. But um, from a fantasy point of view, I think all we can do is look at the opportunity that creates and um, and work out what we're going to do with it. Yeah, and 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 the you know the the thing it is going to do for us, and we it's similar with Sam Doherty too in the back line with him now being out for the year too, is these were players that were going to be so highly owned, their ownership percentages were going to be so high. Now that we don't have them, and we'd love to be able to own them, we're going to have to wait until two thousand and twenty to be able to do that. Um, yep. The fact is, there are now new variables that come into place. Coaches that were planning to have him, you know, for the next 60 days in their teams, the good news is you can now get anyone. If, if for you, I think when we talk about replacements, maybe we'll start here in salary caps, Jimmy, before we name specific players. If there was a player um, that you just couldn't afford to have because you were, you wanted Tom Mitchell in your starting squad, I think the silver lining for you in this, now we're moving very much into an opportunity side of looking at this injury, is you can now go and get that player. It doesn't have to be a midfielder. It can be you couldn't have afforded um, Rory Laird and a Jake Lloyd in your back line or a Devin Smith and a Patrick Dangerfield. All of a sudden now, significant salary cap has become available to you. Now, while we all would love to have Tom Mitchell, I guess the positive for us is there's now that opportunity to get somebody else that you previously couldn't have got. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and at this early stage of preseason too, you know, in, in some ways, um, you know, if it had to happen, it's uh, better. I say with inverted commas that it, that it happens now rather than uh, you know two days before the season starts because we're we're not locked into a, a structure. You, you you know, we might have been playing with the the various team pickers for a few weeks, but there's nothing that's set in stone or locked away. No. And so. You take Tom Mitchell out, and suddenly there's a whole lot of room with which to change things and look at different options, and and that salary cap will spend itself, I'm sure. But uh, it's yeah, it, it just creates that point of difference now. The the bigger impact is is potentially for for those who were planning to go against him and and not start him for the year. Um, you know, then that that's now everybody's position. So it's not that unique yes. uh, starting point that you would have had otherwise. No, that's correct. All of a sudden now, if, if you were a Tom Mitchell owner, which a, a vast majority of coaches were, were certainly heading towards that, all mm-hmm. of a sudden now you're looking at guys that you may have been looking over as an upgrade target. Now, Jackson McRae, you know, w- was phenomenal last year for us. He averaged 122 in, in AFL Fantasy um, and... Um, 
an AFL dream team um, while in Supercoach last year. Um, he averaged no, not too far off that to a, a 127, you know. So he, he was right up high in the mix. So maybe all of a sudden he's now straight into that equation for you. Maybe it's the Brody Grundy that you couldn't have afforded. Now you can. It's it's Cripps. It's Oliver. Um, it, it, it's Fife. It's Kelly. It's now finding the money to get a Matt Crouch. You know, you've now got these guys that you really, in, in a replacement sense, uh, got some more salary cap relief, as well as now the opportunity to go and bring a guy that you believe enters into the top eight midfielder um, consideration for the year. Yeah, that's it. So I think that, yeah, as much as there's a, a lot of panic and um, yeah, exaggeration going, yeah, it's yeah, a lot of drama just generally on social media at the minute about this from a fantasy point of view. I think um, yeah, when the, the dust settles and everything's clear again, I think um, yeah, we'll quickly realise that it's just a, an opportunity now to pick someone else and to probably upgrade another player or two along the way. It's um, just going to be a different use of that salary cap money now. Yeah, exactly right. You know, let, let's talk about how this impacts Hawthorne um, and, and some potential opportunities of players. And then I want to get your, cape, your take on keeper leagues, both for new and existing, because it's still very um, relevant through there. From a Hawthorne perspective, um, very much was the inside ball winner. Um, so with guys like Wingard, while he can win his own ball, He's a, a potential candidate, but I think they recruited him for a reason anyway, um, and he's not the in-and-out bull. I, I think some guys that it, it could see a, a fantasy scoring bump, um, Liam Shields um, is certainly in contention. Um, Jaeger O'Meara, um, certainly um, in contention for that. Possibly Daniel Howe moves away from a tagging role to more of a, a ball-winning role. And then the one that I know a few people are already quite keen on because he does have forward status could be a, a second-year player in James Warple. Are there any Hawk yeah. players you feel like could get a little bit of a, a bump in their fantasy scoring output because of it? I feel like it is more your, your Warple types. Um, you know, the, the the younger kids who are, are going to get that little more opportunity than they had before, I, I tend to think that the... The, the Jaggers and the Shields were, um, you know, were doing their role anyway, regardless of Mitchell. And, and in fact, if anything, might mean they, their scoring could potentially suffer because mm. they're not on the other end of one of his 43 handballs a game. So yeah. it, um, I think, yeah, the getting that extra mid-time into the, the younger developing players and uh, we'll learn a lot about who Hawthorne are going to give that opportunity to over the next couple of months. But uh, a kid like Warple would have to be right in the frame for that, I would have thought. Yeah, I think so. And you're, you're right. We're recording this um, just mere hours after hearing about the injury and the confirmation that he's going to miss most of, if not all of, 2019. And let's be honest, the Hawks were building their preseason knowing that he was going to be there. So they too mm. are only just gathering their thoughts of, okay, how are we now going to structure up our midfield rotations? Now who's a part of our midfield group? What adjustments do we need to make? And, and that's certainly a big um, kind of decision for the Hawks to make. Thankfully for them, they've got a number of months before round Round one gets underway to kind of feel comfortable um, with with a structure and a, and a group of midfielders that they think is going to help them um, get where they want to get in 2019. Let's talk keeper leagues and, and maybe even a seasonal draft. Let's talk seasonal draft, actually. Yeah, okay. Is it, You're not picking him? Is it worth even the vague possibility of just stuffing him away on as an emergency on your bench on the hope he comes and plays a couple of games, or are you just wasting a selection with picking him? <laughs> Yeah, I think at this point you're wasting it. The um, the only way that that becomes of any real benefit is if he does come back for your your draft final, so yeah. the last four rounds of your regular season. Um, and is there a, a case in which Hawthorne would bring him back at that time if it's not readily apparent much earlier that he's going to be doing? I, I don't know that there is. It's um. Yeah, you know, much like, yeah, and we saw that last year with a handful of those you know, similar, well, um, not similar types, but similar injuries where they were ruled out for the season. Are they going to come and play the last couple of rounds? Yeah. Um, yeah the, yes and no. Um, I don't think, you know, Hawthorne have said already that he's going to miss the season. And yeah. so that um, is a pretty big indicator if they're saying that in January. Um, by the time your draft rolls around in a, another six or eight weeks, then, yeah, maybe we might know a little more then and it does become a viable option. Um, but at this point, I probably wouldn't be worrying too much about it. What you'll probably find is someone in, in the league 
we'll pick him up with that last pick just to stash on the bench for a while and yeah. get sick of holding him after a month or two and he'll find his way back to waivers again before the end of the season. Yeah. Uh, so there's always going to be opportunity to pick him up later on if there looks like there might be a chance he plays. Yeah, no, I think I so. I wouldn't think there is at this point. No, no gosh, not, not at this point. Uh, let's talk keeper leagues. There's two strategies mm-hmm. here. Uh, there's a brand new keeper league and there's one that's existing. In a new keeper league, yep. where does he go? Because in a normal keeper league, he you could build a case that it's probably Grundy or he that go number one or number two. Um, like if you've got a third pick in the overall new keeper league, Tom Mitchell's gone to you prior to injury. Now... Yep. Where do you look at getting him? Because not only is he going to miss this year, it is clearly such a severe injury to his leg that he's not just missing the year, but it's going to take him a long period of time. There's history enough when you look at someone like a Michael Barlow, whose first name that comes to mind, it's then an extra 12 months again, you know, once they're back to fitness, where they're fully firing. So we're talking 2021, albeit speculative, that Mitchell's back to his point scoring best. Where do you pick him in a brand new keeper league? It's yeah, it's a tough one. Look, I I don't think I'd be taking him first round. I think that's I think a given at this point. He mm. we know that when he is at, at his best, he's, he's clearly the best sco- uh, point scoring player in the competition. But mm. when you're playing play- keeper leagues, you're playing for premierships, and so I think you're basing as much as anything that if you are taking him, you're sacrificing your first round pick for what for 12 months your last round pick yeah. yes it's, um you're giving away that player so i think it would be a little rash to go and jump on him too early with that in mind there's still value in a keeper in keeping him part yeah. of it will also be dependent on how deep your league is um if you're playing in a, a competition where you only hold 10 players out of your list rolling into the next year, there's obviously a lot less value than if you're playing in one where you keep 35 out of 40. So yeah. it's, um, that, that's obviously got to be a factor as well. But um, I'd be inclined, personally, to sort of try and judge it on how the first two or three rounds play out mm. and what players you do get in that time and then look at him from there. And if you're feeling like you're, you're going to be in a position to contend while he's sitting there on your bench not doing anything for a year, then yeah. um, by all means, load him up and, and put him away in there. But um, if, you're, if you're not quite so comfortable and you feel that you're going to need every pick you've got, then um, I'd be inclined to let someone else take that risk and then go and make a sneaky offer six months down the track when they've had him not delivering for a long period of time and might just be willing to sell him for a little less than he's worth. Yeah, no, fair enough to I, I don't mind that strategy. In an existing Keeper League... Um, it's an interesting dilemma, maybe even more so than where you pick him in a, in a brand new one because people that have Tom Mitchell are probably always in contention um, for, with their list um, point of view. Do you look to do what you've said? Go to win the premiership now or is, you know, again, every keeper league and the variations of where their list is at. So there's more than just a, a one-size-fits-all. Talk oh, to me through the strategy of holding him in, in an existing keeper league and then conversely, yeah. talk me through the strategy of what you'd be wanting in return if you were to move on one of the best fantasy scorers in the game. Yeah, that's that's really the thing. And a player like Mitchell, that is such a huge advantage to have in a, a league where nobody else can have him. It's um, you, You've really, at, at the best of times, you've got to play, pay significant overs to get him out. Um, now that he's injured, and, and whoever is holding him is going to want to look at that basis of he's going to be back at some point. And, and I feel that getting him out of a team like that is going to be pretty hard. If if I had him and I was going to contend and not having him was going to make it hard to win a premiership, then, yeah, you look to move him on, but you play hardball on it, I think. You don't want to sell him too cheaply. You're not going to go and uh, swap him for, for Sean Grigg or a... No. Yeah, um, or even a Liam Shields type. I think you'd be, you'd be selling him well too short for that. You, you'd need to be getting a genuine premium but at that next tier down from, from where Mitchell clearly stands by himself. So I dare say you're not going to be able to swap him for Jackson McRae either after the year he's just had. But um, if you can get a, someone who is a, a short of a, a 100 points um, or 105, 110 sort of average uh, in exchange for him, um, where the person you're trading him to is quite happy to see the way and bank that higher return later, but in the meantime helps you 
replace him and, and continue a march to a premiership, then that would sort of be the line I'd be looking to go down. Yeah, yeah. there's so many different ways you can look at it. You can be a Tom Mitchell owner right now going, I know how good he is, I know the advantage he is, and then looking at the state of your list that you've got already, knowing that now you're probably going to have to go and recruit another midfielder um, into your list before list lodgement or draft an extra earlier one or trade for one. You look at him and you go, I know how good he is. I can... I can still be the, where I want to be for my long-term and immediately strategy by holding him, so I'm going to do that. I understand why no one would consider moving him on. I understand that. Conversely, I understand why some coaches in keeper leagues going, I love owning him, but I'm in the window of opportunity that right now I've got to take it. And I know I don't have him this year, and I don't know what he's going to come back like. But if I can land myself a Matt Crouch in the process, if I can yeah. land myself that and probably something extra on top of that, um, if I can land myself a clear big top eight um, player, especially a midfielder, you're probably going to the replacement. You're probably not going, oh, go and get myself, you know, an Alex Witherden now. You're wanting a midfielder replacement. Um, you want that and something else to feel like I know what I'm letting go of. Maybe there's a coach, you know, maybe there's a just a really bullish Hawks fan in your list that really wants him or someone that's always bugged you for him. Now you can go, look, I don't really want to give him up, but if you want him, this is the only time I'm prepared to sell him to you. Yeah, that's it. Make an offer. And and I think the thing with that too is the, the longer you wait to try and get him out of a uh, out of a current owner, mm. if, if you don't have him but you want him, uh, the longer you wait to do that, the more you'll have to pay. He's going to be a lot more expensive. Uh, I'd imagine in a trade where the current owner has sat with him for, for three, four, five months without any return, but can see that light at the end of the tunnel yeah, three right. or five months closer um, than he is now where he's a, a whole season away. So I think if you were going to try and get him, then uh, doing so, uh, once that initial pain has worn off, because I mean, emotions might be running a little high at the minute, but yep. um, yeah, over the next few weeks would be the time to try and make a, a quiet little offer of, um, yeah, and, and not an insulting offer either. Because no, yeah, don't go... And turn around and say, no, get stuffed, you're not having him for anything. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're not going, here's Sean Grigg, um, you know, here's Richard Douglas. Yeah. You're not you're not just blowballing a guy. You're going, no, I've got to give you a premium in return. And I know it's going to hurt me, you know, for 12 months to pass up this guy and something else, but yeah. I'm prepared to do it for what I think he will be once he returns. Equally, if you're giving him up, you've got to be well compensated in a keeper league because... You may not be thinking just about this year. Your your list may be in such a great state that you go, yeah, okay, I'm probably going to lose about 30 to 50 points a game now, um, you know, per round. But oh, I should be able to cover that up somewhere else. And I my keeping list is big enough. He's such a great player that why would you give him away for anything, even if it is for a year? I, I, I think what does happen, sadly, with Tom Mitchell and also, you know, Sam Doherty, when we come back and look at salary cap games now, um, is it gives us so many more unique teams than we were ever going to get. And it makes guys that we were not sure of really become incredibly, incredibly relevant all of a sudden. Where you were previously like, oh, I might not start with Laird. Well, now you probably are because Docker is out. Where you were like, oh, I might I might not start with Zach Merritt or I might not start with Josh Kelly or, oh, no, nah, Cornelio, not too sure. Now, all of a sudden, these guys, their ownership numbers combined are going to grow because that ownership percentage of Mitchell was so high, those selections have got to go somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's only a good thing for the game. Like yeah, I think so. Honest. Yeah. Horrible for the people. We wish them all the best in their recovery. But from a pure gameplay from fantasy football, this now is another of what has already been a new variable with Doherty out, another new set of variables that come in, which will make teams more different than ever before. And different teams mean different strategies, mean different combinations, and that can only be a good thing for the game. So while it's horrible for Tom and we do wish him all the best, for fantasy coaches, there's new players to think about, new premiums to consider, and maybe some changes, in fact, definitely to my 50 most relevant. Ah, oh, darn. Yeah, good luck sorting that out. Yeah, I know. He was in such a good position to her. <sighs> oh, well. Think of the positives, everybody. That's all we can do. Hey, man, appreciate your thoughts. Jumping on quickly to have a quick chat about Tom Mitchell and what the impact of his season absence now means for us as fantasy coaches. 
Yeah, no worries at all, mate. Anytime. No, we'll try and get an article uh, up in uh, the next couple of days to discussing Tom Mitchell at coachespanel.tv. While you're there, you can go and check maybe some premium midfielders we've already revealed uh, in the 50 most relevant at coachespanel.tv. And new podcasts coming every single day. And as soon as news breaks like this, we'll try and get it to you as well. Thanks for being a part of the journey of the Coaches Panel. More podcasts, more content coming real soon.